So it is with great pleasure that I uh, welcome Betsy Arnold Lee, um, a favourite of VIDM, back again this year in 2024. Betsy has been a midwife for over 35 years and in a healthcare for almost 50 years. Currently in a midwifery-led practice in Brooklyn, New York, she's been active in local, state and national midwifery issues and participates in midwifery education. Her passion for the art and science of midwifery, hand skills and knowledge led to her to pursue a doctorate in midwifery. Her topic being abdominal palpation in expert practitioners. She has presented manual rotation and other strategies for managing occipital posterior presentations in multiple conferences and arenas. So a huge welcome, Betsy, and thank you for coming to the VIDM once again. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited. A happy International Day of the Midwife to all of you. Um, whatever hour it is for you, it's 7 o'clock in the morning for me here. Um, and I'm most excited to be here. So uh, my original plan was to feature non-US, non-European, Eurocentric voices on the subject of OP. Um, but there are a few voices outside of that specific realm. So I really wanted to get speakers from, I had, from Africa, from Indonesia, from China. We have a few articles, but I really couldn't pull it off when, once I really got started, because probably I started a little too late, I'll be honest. Next year, I have a plan, and we're going to talk about that later, but everybody pay attention for that part. Um, next slide, please. So this is me, where I work. I'm in a little hospital in New York, which is part of a larger uh, healthcare conglomerate. This is my email. Um, it's a separate one from my other emails because I'm going to focus on something later on, and so I hope you'll all use it. Um, I have no financial disclosures, no conflicts of interest, and when you talk, and just so you know, when I start, I'm just trying to accumulate the information so I can give it back to you. I have been introduced as someone who knows what she's doing. I have just collected the wisdom of my foremothers. Okay. That's all I've done. And I'm giving it back to you. I know that I'm getting towards the end of my career, maybe like another five or 10 years. And I want to make sure that everything I've collected comes back to you. So when we talk about the um, sustainability, the UN definition is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs, economic, social, environmental. Well, then midwives are like right up there in, in those people who do that on a daily basis. We're the ultimate in sustainability. Think of what you do every day providing care and giving advice to those people who gestate, give birth, raise the following generation. That is, de that is basically the definition of sustainability. So everything you do is sustainability. Um, I, I had to take out my, my, uh, thank, my thank you slide with all the pictures of all the people I thank for this presentation, all the people I've learned from, because I was trying to save a little uh, time. But um, you'll see some of them as we go along. I want to thank all those people who have taught me over all the years and all the people I've cared for and learned from. I learned about OP when I was a young nurse. Um, I had pushed with somebody for hours and in many positions, I could see the top of the head in the back of the vagina and I could not get the baby out. So the, I was, the doctor who was with me at the time said, you can't win them all. I did not like that. So I began studying, I gathered articles, workshops, and so now, like I said, I have a knowledge base, but I'm going to share it, and you don't need all of these tricks at every birth, but you might, you know, keep some of them in the back of your pocket, because you never know when you're going to need them. I really personally think that there's different kinds of OP, but we'll talk about that. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is, you know, you're going to see more of these uh, 
disclaimers as we go along. It's more appropriate to use gender neutral language. And I really try to do that pregnant person rather than pregnant woman, health during pregnancy rather than maternal health. But most of the literature and statistics don't go coincide with that. So and I can't change what's already written and published. So I really try to go that way, but it doesn't always work. So sometimes this presentation will not use gender neutral language, but I really try. And also most of the literature that's published across the globe varies in definitions and descriptions of race. One cannot always compare what looks like apples and apples because what they use in the United States and what is used in the UK and in other places is not always the same. And given this disparities, particularly in the United States, um, that it's evident that uh, we have some issues. And there's sometimes when I, you know, I really want to say we need to question how we apply the data from the United States to others. So I really do believe that. Could I have the next slide, please? Most of what is taught on OP is not supported by the evidence. But as Penny Simpkin, you know, God rest her little soul, she died uh, just recently, said, most of what we know about labor isn't either. Most of what we do, some of it is supported by the evidence, but some of we do just because this is what we have done for millions of years. Next slide, please. We're gonna do a quick overview of, of persistent occipit posterior, okay? Most common presentation, malpresentation of the fetus and 20 to 35% 20, of labors. When you looked at that poll in the beginning, 25% of people in this, on this poll had experienced an OP labor, right dead smack in the middle of it. And most of us were midwives. Most 90% rotate to a more favorable OA position. And depending on the study that you look at, 1.78 to 12% of fetuses remain persistently, or as I like to say, obstinately, occipital posterior up to or at birth. ROP is five times more common than the LOP, but that's most of the research believes that it's because of the flexion of the colon and that's how the baby sits in. Those LOP babies, those are the sneaky ones that you often have a hard time with because they can't really rotate. And it accounts for up to 12 to 18% of the cesarean births, again, based on your study. And why do we get concerned about those 10% that don't rotate? Well, just think about it. I use just my numbers. If we have approximately, I'd like to do rough statistics, 4 million births, that's about 40,000 uh, persistent occipital posteriors, okay? If we have a 35% 30, section rate in the United States, 1.4 million, it's estimated that OP accounts for 168 to 200,000 of those cesareans. And that's a lot in terms of effects on people, in terms of effects on the economy. So we really should, we do, if we could figure out how to take care of those abstinent ones, then we would be doing a re, everyone a really great service. Could I have the next slide, please? So the sequela of OP are longer labors. This is nothing you don't know. Longer labors, maternal exhaustion, hospital transfer, increased operative birth, and increased hemorrhage, higher order of laceration, increased infection from mother and baby, longer hospital stays. And when, I mean, I do have a few articles from the continent of Africa. There is increased maternal and neonatal morbidity um, in some places because that's when you're talking about obstruction um, obstruction labor and impacted labor. And there's a couple of older controlled comparison studies that really uh, talk to that. So like I said, we got to identify those babies that won't turn. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is, this is the big issue. The larger biparietal diameter has to negotiate the maternal pelvis. And those are our lovely pictures. I'm trying to breeze through these people. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Allie? And how do we know it? This is where, where a lot of my work comes in. Diagnosis is the back pain, coupling of contractions, a long desultory labor, vaginal exam. On the abdominal exam with the Leopold maneuvers, you can feel the small parts. You feel the cephalic prominence, that divot, that little like soap dish right above the symphysis. Um, where are the fetal heart tones? They're, in the, they're more towards the side. They're muffled. 
And one of the things I really find is that the lie is askew. So yes, the baby is laying up straight up and down, but often you'll find that it's hanging out more to one side than the other, because when the head is not well flexed like this, the baby's kind of going like that. And, but the evidence tells us that ultrasound may be the best way to do that. And our skills come from training. And many studies say that they're not perfect, which is why, they, why evidence is, says that the ultrasound is the gold standard. Could I have the next slide, please? So ultrasound may be the only way, reliable way to determine fetal position. But not everyone has access to ultrasound. Um, in labor, babies rotate. Um, if they're, as you all know, they're part of the mechanisms of labor. It's how they get out of OP, sometimes how they get into it. Um, and if you follow the progress of labor, you know that the baby is moving and turning for the most part. And also, the babies don't stay just like this. They're not like this, turning side to side like this. They are, their heads are turned to one side. That's the whole deal. All right. Could I have the next slide, please? And if the baby remains persistently occipital posterior at birth, only 23 to 57% of parturients experience a spontaneous vaginal birth. That 57% are multiparous patients. Okay, so if if it's if you've had a few babies and your baby is is posterior, about half of you will have a spontaneous vaginal birth. Everybody else has an operative birth. If it's your first baby, only a quarter. So these are really, you know, these are things that we really have to look at to really try to figure out how are we going to get these babies out. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is a, a really important thing. So when I was saying those babies are askew, the fetal spine and the fetal head may be in different positions. We, I have uh, four or five studies now that show that just what I said and what you know, the baby's head moves around. It is not necessarily in alignment. The baby's head may be OP, and the the, but the body may be in a lateral position with the back on the side. When the fetal spine and the fetal occiput are posterior, when they're both direct OP, the birth will likely occur from the posterior. This is where, this is the area where everybody gets, um, where we have problems. And if the fetal head is OP, but the spine is lateral, birth is more likely to occur in the OA position. The back is the answer. If you can get the back and move that around, you are going to be okay for the most part. Like Kevin Riley said to me, you can't win them all. Could I have the next slide, please? So where is the research? I wish I was a fancy person who could make pretty colors on this. The majority of the, of the research comes from North America, from the United States, from Canada, a lot from Europe, uh, Australia. They had the lovely uh, pop-out trial. Uh, but I have a few articles from Russia, from China, um, from, I mean, there's a very lovely one from Spain, uh, which still is in Europe, but there's few articles from outside those areas, and we need to work on that. Um, I've been able to find some, you know, from Russia and China and other places and get it, had them translated, and they're really very interesting. And it, most of what we get are we're basically all doing similar strategies. Do what you can to keep the baby upright, the mother upright, and then move on. And I keep searching. Send me some. Next slide, please. So in the research, the contributing factors are nulliparity, maternal stature, less than 5'2", okay? Epidural at birth um, has a more has a higher chance of having a, an OP baby. People often say, well, yeah, but they had so much pain, so we gave them an epidural. The studies do say that it is, if you give the epidural too early, that that prevents the baby from coming down. A narrow suprapubic arch. If that angle 
in, in the front is less than 90 degrees. Maternal age over 35. There's weak evidence for fetal sex. Uh, there was a couple of studies that tried to say that it was a, a male fetus, but that does not hold out in some of the larger studies. An anterior placenta was again in some of the older literature. Post-maturity, weight gain, estimated fetal weight. When you lump those together, anything that makes the baby larger tends to put you in a higher, uh, you know, a higher chance of having an occipit posterior baby. However, many of you know that sometimes you get the, those little tiny babies who are only five pounds and they come down direct OP as well. And those are also very problematic. Much of the, uh, I would say primarily the literatures from the United States tried to say that race is a factor. And when you look at the international literature, that does not hold out. Also, if, if race were the factor the way that the United States portrays it, it would be like there would, should be a whole lot more OP in Africa and other countries, and that's not, not hold true. So we have to really look at that with a very critical eye. Could I have the next uh, slide, please? All right. These are, this is just a summary of some of the studies of what they've come up with in the associated factors. Rotation is, is OP. Um, do you start out OP and stay there or do you rotate to OP? And that's a mixed study, although most people feel that if you really stay OP, for the most part, that's how you started out and that's how you just didn't rotate out. Antenatal prevention, there's nothing that's identified. And you can see the, the um, number of participants in these studies. Labor management, um, I have six now that are really very good. And the fetal sp spine piece is really where I think the answer is going to be. Um, we have five prospective cohort studies. So I think that that's a really good place to be. Could I have the next slide, please? All right, labor management, traditional optimal positioning, uh, spinning babies, the mild circuit, manual rotation or digital rotation. So now I have four randomized controlled studies that show maternal position may increase rotation to OA from OP. However, there's something that I just found from Canada that, that um, is a meta-analysis and says that this may not be true. So we still have to keep on working through all this. All this literature changes on a regular basis. And to me, there... We, I think it, the part of the problem is, is that we always, we don't, we're not sure what the question is to ask. We've tried all these little different things. We don't really know what are the questions to ask. Okay. May I have the next slide, please? So what do the gaps in the research tell us? Most babies are going to rotate. Okay. Even in the pop, the pop out study, I was waiting for that one. I was so excited when it came out and then I read it and it was like, well, it might do a little bit, but ever. But when you looked at the study, it was a very well thought out study. It was excellent in how they randomized people. But there were arms of the study where those babies were so smart and they rotated before they could even be randomized. And those arms were bigger than the actual numbers that wound up being in the, in the randomized groups. So for me, it was an amazing thing to learn that. I think that different, uh, there are some different types of OP. Is it because the he maybe the head just really, maybe the answer is the head is not flexed well, because that seems to be a lot of what I see on a daily basis. So we need to think about those things. And what are the strategies that we have to work with them? Are there signs when, early on when we, you know, in some places you should move to a higher level of care if you're a community midwife? And I really think this baby is, you know, should everybody who's OP move to a higher level of care? Absolutely not. But what are the strategies and signs that we can learn and share amongst ourselves that say, listen, this is one of those ones where I think we're going to get it in trouble and we need to move. Because some people in the community, it's a much bigger deal to move. You know, I mean, for me, 
in the community. I have gone to many um, births in the home as a consultant. My friends will call me up and they will say, hey, I have this thing. Would you come over? And I will go over and help them. For us, the bigger thing is deciding because in the United States, home birth is not very well accepted. So what we have to do is really get the, the laboring person to agree to go, um, unless it's a, you know, like a stat emergency. We have to arrange for transport. We have to get the hospital to accept you. In other places, you know, from my understanding in the UK, that you know, it's, it's part of the system. If it doesn't work here, we go over here. That's fine. I'm sure that there are other issues involved and it's not as simple as that. But for those people who are in more rural areas, it's a much bigger deal and you have greater distances to travel. So those are, you know, the things that we have to, that we need to really think it, you know, are there early signs when we should move to a higher level and bag the whole thing? And does anybody have a magic wand to cure this? I would like that. Um, could I have the next slide, please? I don't know how that little bag of forceps got on the side. So what are our strategies? In general, when you look at all these things, it's you want to change the angles of the pelvis so that the pelvis gets a little bit more room. All right. Straighten the angle of the head and the body. That's the asyncretism. All right. When the head is not well flexed. That is something I think that is really important. Do anything you can to make the room. I have some pictures of some of the things we can do. Get the head under the symphysis. Oftentimes when people are pushing, you see the head just kind of rocking, that rocking under the symphysis. And you can, you know, you can tell that that poor front of the baby's head is smashing up against the symphysis and pain management because it really hurts a lot. Could I have the next slide, please, Alan? So these are a lot of our strategies that we use. Um, the, on the top left is the... Um, the knees together position, which is basically you put the knees together. And when you do that, it rotates the trochanters out and gives you a little bit more room in the back of the pelvis. That's always where you need the room for the baby to rotate. Um, that's a picture of my, uh, the next picture is my, uh, it's, it's basically my fat cells because I, when I, as a baby researcher, I did not know I should have take, gotten a permission to take a picture of somebody while we were doing this study. So I had to go back and make one up, but you know, straightening the baby out. That's what I'm doing. What's what we're doing there is trying to straighten the baby out into a, a more straight line. Um, those uh, in the next one is uh, saline injections, little subdermal saline injections that use the gate theory to dis uh, decrease some pain. Lunges, that's one that's changing the angles because once you do that, you're changing the angle of the pelvis. Uh, sifting with the rebozo, uh, hands and knees. Uh, the next ones are from the midwifery studies. Uh, that is called the one with the, uh, on the second row in the far left. That is uh, Buena Vista's uh, position i always call it the star and that's how i got you know a little infamous in my institution one of the physicians came and said i need listen this baby's op i'm going to need to do a c-section i want you to come in and help me out and tell her that and i said okay well if i have an hour before you call it i would like to help it so we put her in this what i call the star it's basically a modified lateral position and the baby rotated. He was annoyed at me because then he thought he'd have to push for three hours and then do the C-section and she delivered in 20 minutes. And then the funnier part was when he at the holiday party demonstrated this position with him on one foot trying to balance was most interesting. The next one is an, a variation of that, uh, which is the fire plug. The next one is Walters, which is an old midwifery position. We have it documented in the 1600s uh, in, in some textbooks. And you bring the, them all the way down, and it helps engage, get the head to come down and engage. The happy baby pose, again, that's a lot of those flex, you know, those flex, flex uh, hyperextended legs. Um, flex the head, super pubic 
when the head is coming underneath the symphysis because when because the birth of the baby at this point what as the head comes underneath the symphysis in op is by flexion not by extension so if you get above the symphysis and flex that head up so it comes underneath the symphysis that's how you're going to get it done and the Ritkin maneuver is the same position is the same principle so you go behind and you lift that head up so it helps come under the symphysis of course, manual rotation, either the full manual rotation or the digital one. And if all else fails, then you're left with an operative birth, either forceps or a cesarean. And, you know, for me, I have seen the efficient, you know, what they used to do. It is particularly in the United States, you won't find this as much. They're losing the art of forceps, where they did the Scanzoni maneuver with the Keelan forceps, and they would put those on. Whoops, I lost my things. They would put those on, rotate the baby, remove them, reapply, and then deliver the baby. And I had some people who really did excellent, excellent um, uh, four-step births. Could I have the next slide, please? I just want to check my time. So these are the four. These are four research studies by midwives. Buena Vista in Spain, Yang in China, Liu and Bamal in Iran. And these were, uh, you know, reasonably large studies that confirmed uh, the OP position and then randomized people into different methods. One of the issues with doing these studies is that we know that no matter what we do, Abdominal palpation and vaginal exam may not be 100% accurate. The sonograms um, are supposed to be more accurate. Once you have someone who knows what they're doing, uh, in some of the larger studies in the beginning, they had to throw out um, up to 10% of the participants because the people who were doing the sonograms were not actually well trained and did not actually provide good pictures for identifying OP. So nothing is 100%, okay? But these studies show that with um, the, that modified SIMS, that uh, Yang did, a, um, she had a, it was like a stepwise kind of uh, thing where, uh, people were put in one position, then they used the birthing stool, then they used another thing, um, and they had shorter labors, less bleeding and pain. Uh, Liu is the maternal hip extreme flexion. It looks more like the fire plug. And Bamal did the semi-prone versus knee chest. And all of these had increased rates of rotation. And this is the midwifery research where we, this is, this is our sustainability. This is where we need to go. So that, you know, because it's only what we've been doing for millions of years and we need to keep on going. I'd like to point out that OP has been mentioned in many uh, older books. Uh, Justine Singabon from Germany, Louise Bourgeois in in, uh, she was a Flemish midwife in like the 1500s. We have documented evidence uh, that these, we have been managing this for many, many years. And then physicians kind of, you know, stole it for their, for their books. But as we go along, there is more and more documented evidence about what we've been doing. And so we need to keep track of that. All right. It's been there the whole time. It's just that in olden days, you know, women did not, were not literate as much as men. So we have to really work on this. Um, next slide, please. I just want to give you a little blurb about my work, which was abdominal palpation and expert practitioners. It was a very small study. I had um, 17 pairs of expert midwives defined as... Um, having more than five years experience and they also were um, some of them were community-based midwives that was also something that was shown in web study to be make you more accurate so what i found was is that 
all but one were accurate in terms of where the baby's back were. Okay, so if you know where the baby's back is, we're going to be okay. And what happened is, is that um, midwives often closed their eyes or averted their gaze to the maternal abdomen and used their fingers as their eyes to ascertain what was going on. Um, those that were more accurate were a little bit faster. Uh, they picked up the divot. So, and that was what I found. Could I have the next slide, please? So th this is my little thing for, th for, this is our little joy for the day. This poor cup has cracked now and can no longer be used for coffee. I'm very sad, but this, this is it. I, ha I have a lot of talents, but this is my little superpower. And I hope for everybody that this is what you find as you go along. Could I have the next slide, please, Allie? So sustainability, how can we help one another? Like I said, midwives are the ultimate in sustainability for the human race. All of us will face difficulties with natural and man-made obstructions in providing care. All right, I, all of us do. But regardless of the situation, most of us can function without a sonogram. I mean, even here for me, there would be dates like, I don't keep a sonogram in my back pocket. I do have them on the floor. Um, and if before I would do a manual rotation, if I was unsure, I might pull that out. But for me, I, I just see where the baby's heart is and watch the baby rotate. I don't really use all that stuff. I don't need, I don't know, do not need a sonogram. I can use, I can still listen. I don't need a, you know, the Doppler is nice because then the person in labor or in your office can hear the baby's heart. And that's why I actually stopped using uh, a fetoscope in the office was because the the mothers wanted to hear the baby's heart. So that's why I actually stopped a few years ago. But if I don't have one, I can use a fetoscope. I don't, I don't really need that. So we don't need a lot of fancy things. We can function. And as long as I have my hands, I'm really okay. So my plan uh, is for is um, for this. I would like to have midwives from every continent participate in this with me and, and do more of the talking next year. So I'm, my, my email is going to be up at the end. It's focused on, uh, on occipital posterior. It was so bad that when my daughter looked at it, she said, oh, my, that's a different email. And she's like, P-O-P. -P. Oh, like she's listened to this long enough. She knows what it is. Oh, that's that occipital posterior thing. Each of you, keep your own statistics for, you, for yourself, for your local town, your township, your county, your district. Keep your statistics on your births and keep your statistics on OP. Every time you have a birth where you think the baby is OP, write it down. Write down the story. Did the baby turn? Did the baby not turn? What was the outcome? What did you think? What was your process? And send it to my email because I myself do not think that I, I cannot in good conscience say to somebody with an OP baby, you know what, I'm going to randomize you and it may work, it may not work. I just can't do that. Some people can, I can't. I wanted, my plan is to do a qualitative study. So every one of your stories, send it to me. So that then we can see what are the strategies that work? What are the strategies that don't work? Is there something where we can say, hey, this, this is, when you see this, you need to think about moving because it's probably not going to work. Those of you in academia, partner with midwives in places with less access to the microphone and help them with their research. All right? We need to make sure that we get all of this out there. This is our jam, and we make a difference regardless, all right? Um, thank you for your attention. I'm go Could I have the next slide, please? I'm happy to answer any questions, and I hope you're thinking about how we can mitigate the sequela of OP. Uh, please share this with, with your colleagues, because I want 
I want this to go worldwide. This is my goal. That's one of the reasons I'm so happy I get invited to this because it puts us in touch with people in all the world. If you can see the, the lovely, my lovely background, because when I graduated from Midford Free School, my director told me she thought I'd be the first midwife on the moon. That may or may not have been a compliment, but I've taken it as a challenge. And please, any techniques that you have that work, share with your fellow wizards and midwives. Am I done? Oh, yeah. Oh. So any questions? And can you, we, we go to the next slide because that is, that has my email on it. And I'm open to any questions. 